So I'm asking all our leaders now with all sincerity Yeah, yeah who the hell gave you the right to take the guns from me? Well g'day guys, I made it. Here I am down at the uh, Parliament House. Had to go inside and speak to uh, Robert Warzak from the Shooters and Fishers Party. I uh, travelled down last night from Park so I'm uh, a bit weary from the trip but I'm um, going to go in and talk to him today about the up and coming uh, laws that the government's proposing for um, particularly those laws about the new MO laws, trying to make it harder on shooters yet again. And uh, I'm also talking to him about the uh, role that Shooters and Fishers Party have played over the last few years, the years that they've been in Parliament. And I'm going to ask him a few of the questions that you guys presented to me before um, over my YouTube channel and just stuff that you guys want to know. So I'm going to head in there and uh, see if we can come up with some uh, answers to some of the stuff that they've been doing. Also I want to talk to him specifically about what the Shooters and Fishers Party does and how they sort of helped us over the years and what they've done. So. We'll see what happens, hopefully it'll be a good interview. So I'm asking all our leaders now with all sincerity Yeah, who the hell gave you the right to take the guns from me? Yeah, who the hell gives you the right to take the guns from me? G'day, so here we are. We're at the uh, Parliament House. I'm just about to speak to uh, Robert Borzak from the Shooters and Fishers Party. Okay, so straight into it, I'll just ask you this first question. With this um, this more recent bill that's coming up now with the ammunitions bill, um, where do we stand? What's, what's the Shoes and Fishers Party actually trying to achieve? I mean, obviously they're trying to achieve to try and stop a lot of this stuff, but what's the process and, and how hard is it for you guys to stop these things that are coming on? Okay, well that's a, that's a good question, Steve. First of all, just a little bit of background. Uh, this, uh, this bill actually came out of... Uh, uh, a, a knee-jerk reaction from the government in its response to uh, trying to uh, trying to deal with the criticism it's getting from the media and also from uh, voters in not dealing with all the drive-by shootings that are occurring here in Sydney and these drive-by shootings are being done by criminals uh, not by law-abiding firearms owners like yourself and yep. and myself and, uh, and uh, yeah, nearly 200,000 others in New South Wales um, We've also got to understand that in New South Wales as in other parts of, of the country, we've got uh, a bureaucracy that's, uh, and I'm talking here about, not, not talking about the police themselves, I'm talking about the police bureaucracy that sits in behind it that makes policy. And they've been rather desperate for a lot of years. You, in New South Wales we've got gun-hating bureaucrats, that's what it gets down to. People have signed on to the 1996 uh, John Howard uh, firearms laws who really want to see us with no firearms at all. Uh, they don't want us to have anything. Um, and it started with uh, the 96 buyback and then we had the 2002 buyback, etc. Uh, 2002 to 2003 buyback uh, of pistols. They're keen to see us with nothing. Um, they have it, that's their agenda. And under the last I suppose six, seven, eight years under the previous Labor government in New South Wales, uh, all we had was good news stories for the firearms owners of New South Wales uh, and the work that the Shooters and Fishers Party was doing. We had uh, four significant firearms amendment bills passed and we also had a significant bill passed in the uh, creation of the Game Council in New South Wales, which of itself was uh, a major, major initiative that the party had been working on for the best part of 12 or 13 years yep. and when it finally happened. Um, so, in a way, things have been, uh, in inverted commas, uh, pretty good for shooters in New South Wales. Um, so it's no surprise to see that um, when you get a major change of government and you get the coalition coming in, um, uh, the coalition is uh, from the school uh, of, of Johnny Howard, but so perhaps there's a bit of a bent there to look to try and control firearms a bit more than what the Labor government were doing, who were looking at it more logically. Um, but I believe that they've been in turn misled by the, uh, the police bureaucracy into thinking that, uh, and badly advised, into thinking that if they could just do something with ammunition, and I'm sure they were, they were getting other advice too from the police bureaucracy that would have been a lot more draconian than what we've seen, that they would like to uh, implement, um, try to do what every politician or a lot of politicians have done in the past, blame the law-abiding firearms owners for what's going on by the criminals when they know as well as you and I do that 85% um, of the firearms that are, are confiscated in crime have never been registered 
and those that have been registered, the other 15%, uh, by far and above the majority of those, something like 12 to 13%, have been stolen from the military, from the police themselves, or from security companies. Right. So the reality is that a tiny, minuscule number of firearms get involved in crime, have anything to do with people like you and I. But it plays good to the media, uh, because uh, the Greens have always run the line that, you know, if we could get rid of all firearms in society, somehow or rather, with a wave of the magic wand, all crime would disappear or all firearms used in crime would disappear. Now you and I both know that that's rubbish yeah. because as far as they're concerned, that they've got a different agenda and their agenda is a political change agenda and, a, and a, any, any society that doesn't have the right or to use and own firearms uh, uh, as part of the citizenry's rights uh, is a society that basically doesn't have any freedoms at all. And you'll see the freedom of speech disappear and gradually things will get wound up. You're already seeing that in, in happen in Canberra now, where with, with the Greens are now pushing for tighter controls on the media. In case some of the viewers don't actually understand or don't know about the law, what is the law they're actually trying to bring in? What's the, how does it affect us? The law they're talking about bringing in is uh, there'll be a requirement for you to prove that you have a firearm of a particular calibre registered to you when you go to purchase the ammunition. And, and in New South Wales what that means is, because as you know, your licence in New South Wales has your categories on it, on the back of it, and it doesn't have your address on it. Yeah. So, and there's a good reason for that, because there is a need to have a separation from the public and the potential of the public getting access to your information, yes. i.e. where you live and, and where you store your firearms and what firearms you actually own. Yeah. Now what they're saying is you will have to take evidence of that firearm that you own, i.e. your um, registration certificate, because that's the only evidence you've got, yeah. and say it was a 243 or a 270. You want to go to the shop to the, to the gun shop to buy 270 ammunition, you will have to prove that you have a 270 registered to you. It fails every test of what they're pretending that it should be trying to co help control. So it, it, it's bad law. Yes. It's bad law and it shouldn't be done. Yeah. And this is what we've been telling them. And this is what, to everyone's credit in the last three weeks in New South Wales, or everyone that's participated in the process has been telling all the members, especially the national parties, uh, members in this in this state, that this is rubbish, and that if they don't fix it and forget it and drop it, they will pay for it at the next election. Sure. And the Shooters and Fishers Party will make sure they pay for it. Yes. Because we will campaign in lower house seats in the next election. We will put Shooters and Fishers Party candidates into lower house seats, and we will we will uh, recommend votes to the Labor Party. Sure. Okay? That's what we'll do politically. We'll have to do it. We won't have any choice. Yeah. If, the, if this government wants to set itself up as the enemies of shooters and fishers in this state, then it's the shooters and fishers party's job to protect its constituents. Yeah. It's our job. We don't have any choice. I think it's also important for, for shooters and fishers to know that um, we, we have been very, very successful in terms of our last, particularly our last two campaigns. Um, fr from a 2003 vote voting base, we, inc we increased our vote in 2007 by nearly 40 per cent. And we've and in the 2011 election, the one that just passed, where Robert Brown got re-elected, we increased it again by another 40 per cent. That's great. So we, in, the, in the last two terms, we've basically nearly doubled, 98, over 98 per cent increase in our vote. So how much more do we need for the next election to get two extra seats in rather than well, one? Well, the interesting thing is, and, and this is where the education needs to come in, people need to understand, uh, the people that want to vote for us need to understand that there are many false gods. And by saying that, I'm talking about in the last election, uh, there were basically three other organisations competing for our voter base. Yep. Uh, you had Pauline Hanson, yep. you had the Fishing Party, and you had the uh, Outdoor Recreation Party. Now, those three parties took about 185,000 primary votes. Sure. Right? Now, I wouldn't say for one moment that we would have got all those votes, but we, we could have probably justified or looked to get probably a half to three quarters of those yep. votes, especially with the way our vote had increased. And even with Hanson there, we outpolled her uh, two to one. Yep. Okay. Easy. 
she's a, she's a waste of space. Sure. But put that aside, it's important to understand that those votes under the electoral system being run in New South Wales were wasted. Okay. Okay. So if we had got a half or a third of that vote, we would have put another second person up. And that's okay. what we need for the next election. And that's what we need for the next election. But the next election too, what we will do, as I suggested earlier, is we will also run in lower house seats. Yeah. And we'll start to do a lot more of that. And we will target the lower house seats that we're going to run in. And the seats we will target will be the seats of the government that are their most marginal seats. Sure. Uh, because we now have to start doing what the more traditional political parties do, and that is start to participate in the lower house. Yeah. All right, well, just in wrapping this uh, conversation up, I really appreciate your time and everything today. The most common question I get, which you probably get all the time, and it's probably one of those questions that it's just, it's impossible from the, from the 96 buyback and everything. People keep saying to me, when are we gonna get our semi-autos back? And um, like me, for instance, very like very few other people in New South Wales who has a job in um, contract shooting, <coughs> I suppose people would consider me to be one of the lucky ones if you can say that, but it's part of my job as a contract shooter, so I've been, I've, I've been able to um, get the D-Class license. But the majority of people, um, especially people in the city, have zero chance. But uh, but people keep asking me, when are we going to get our semi-autos back? So, so what is the front on that? Is, is there any chance of that? What's what's the long-term thing for that, or short-term? Well, I, I think you're addressing a sort of uh, um, the ascent of Mount Everest. Yeah. Um, to get to get uh, the way we're sitting politically in Australia today, given the uh, the police minister's conference decisions of 1996, yeah. um, I don't think you've got any chance of that um, because every state. And, uh, and federally um, took a decision in 1996 to ban the private ownership of those firearms. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any appetite in this government or any other government around Australia to change that. Okay. In fact, every time we even try to make a small change to um, uh, any of the firearms laws in New South Wales, we bump up against the mantra uh, from the bureau police bureaucrats that this is contrary to the 1996 agreement and we can't do it. Okay. Okay. And that's even on some of the most small, inane and silly things that would make our lives as shooters much easier. Yeah. What we think is a more achievable thing um, in the short run is the complete abolition of the long arms registry. Yep. Uh, we think that that, again, that's not quite Mount Everest, but it's, it's something that should be looked at very carefully because, uh, you know, the Treasuries of Australia have wasted over a billion dollars in the last 16 years just on tracking legal firearms. Yeah. That doesn't count the, doesn't count the money that's been wasted on uh, buybacks. Yeah, okay. Sure. Um, so you've got to say to yourself, and, and New South Wales um, has probably spent, I don't know, of that, Two hundred and fifty million dollars, probably more, yep. in that same period of time, doing the same things, and you've got to say to yourself, wouldn't that money be better off being spent in uh, providing hospitals, uh, better police services, uh, and other public services? Yeah. Um, especially when you look at what's going on at the moment with the economy and the New South Wales Treasury figures that we see from time to time. It's times are tough, times are difficult. Um, that money would be better spent putting into frontline services for the real things that are important rather than trying to treat people like you and I as criminals in waiting or trying to use the law to entrap us uh, into making a mistake because the law the way it's written now is basically, I, I refer to it as glad wrap. Uh, it's wrapped so tightly around us that if they walk into your house and they find a, a cartridge on your bench or they find a um, if you're doing reloading, for example, they find a, a, a tin of powder that hasn't been locked away, you've breached the law. Which in t then you lose your licence for and 10 years or something? And you lose your licence, yeah. Now, these, these sort of silly misdemeanours uh, and this sort of nonsense isn't what the law is meant to be all about. Yeah. Uh, tracking legal, uh, tracking, and I don't know how many there are in private hands in New South Wales, legal firearms doesn't help in controlling crime. 
No. As I mentioned earlier, the, the statistics just don't show that. The reality is that the police know it, and police intelligence knows it, but uh, the, that uh, the by 85%, maybe 90% of uh, illegal firearms, and you're talking mostly pistols and ammunition, are smuggled into Australia and come through our poorest borders. Sure. And I'm not just talking about the borders between New South Wales and Queensland, yeah. I'm talking about the total of Australia. Well, with that registration, do you consider that's an achievable thing? I think in the long run it is achievable. Yeah. Um, because I think ultimately uh, what will happen in society is that uh, they will realise that, uh, society in general will realise that um, tracking legal firearms really only has one purpose. And that one purpose is the ultimate confiscation of all firearms. Sure. The only reason you want to know where they all are is that when the political opportunity comes along, you can grab them all. Sure. There's no other reason for that. Yeah. There's, there is no purpose to it otherwise. This, was, this is the reason they set it all up in 1996. This is the fundamental um, purpose for having registration. I mean, Canada has turned around recently a, and has now, I think they're just about to finish the process, the legal process there, of abolishing their long arms registry. Yeah. And, and New Zealand abolished it years ago. Yeah. Australia should follow suit. Yeah. Australian politicians love using Canada as an example for what we should be doing and what they call progressive laws. Well, let's now really become progressive and let's abolish the long arm registries in Australia and let's start with New South Wales. Yeah. New South Wales is achieving nothing uh, at all with tracking all these fire, all the legal firearms around the state and they're admitting they are losing the war against crime. Uh, and playing pol short-term political games by introducing a, a thing, you know, ineffective, silly bills like the ammunition bill, isn't helping them politically. Yeah. They will find that will hurt them politically in the longer term. And even the media, I don't believe, will swallow this stuff anymore. Yeah. yeah. That's good. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. And, thank uh, you, Steve.